All right. Today is Sunday, June 18th. And welcome to another economic discussion. We're back, folks. We're talking about the economy again. And I got a good one for you tonight. Let's begin with this. What you're looking at right now is the S&P 500, the U.S. stock market. And of course, as you can see, we have reinflation in equities prices. And we have a few schools of thoughts when looking at this. There is the one that I tend to agree with, which is this is a symptom of the fact that the Fed did not go the distance. This is a symptom of the fact that the Fed is not done with the job of tackling inflation down. The fact that the Fed guided the economy and the market by reducing the pace of interest rate hikes and now pausing or skipping by essentially saying that inflation is over. We're done with inflation. The job is over. And therefore, the message for the economy and the market is it is time to indulge again. And boy, talk about indulgence. And of course, in this school of thought, we believe that the Fed is going to realize at some point that the job is not done. And this is the early indicator that the job is not done. And they will have to come back and do more and paralyze the economy for a long, long time. And perhaps this is why even the IMF now says that the Fed may need to hike interest rates even further to cool down an overheating economy. Economist Mohamed Alarian said that the Fed will be making a big mistake if it skips a rate hike this week. And it did skip. More on that in a minute. But there is also another school of thought when looking at the stock market. This school of thought says that the market is predicting a soft landing in the economy situation where inflation goes down and whether interest rates by the Fed stay high or not, there will be minimum damage to the economy. And this team and this school of thought tends to look at the headline CPI, which is now down to 4%, according to the latest reading, but they tend to ignore the core CPI entirely. And even though the Fed's target is 2%, and even if you look at the headline reading, it is double what the Fed is looking at. But this school of thought says that there are lag impacts of what the Fed has done already. And if they pause and they skip right now, the lag impacts would take the CPI down from 4% to 2%, if not even more. But somehow the lag impacts will not impact the economy negatively. Anyways, you can read this headline, for example. It says Larry Summers was wrong about inflation. And to summarize this uh, trash article for you, what he's saying basically is inflation went down to 4% without damaging the economy and therefore Larry Summers is wrong about his thesis that the Fed will have to increase unemployment before we see inflation gone. Now, you can look at the headline reading of the CPI and say, yeah, it went down big, but that's due to base impacts. And that's due mostly to energy prices. And energy prices are really volatile. They can come back up just like they went down. When we look at the core CPI, which they don't want to look at anymore. But if you look at core services, X energy, you can barely see a dent on inflation. Yet they say that Larry Summers is wrong and inflation is gone. Mission accomplished. It's over now. And folks, we're getting closer to the funny season, aka the election. So everybody's going to come out with dismissing the pieces of data that they don't like. Take, for example, regime propagandist and fake economist Paul Krugman, who once suggested that uh, the government should fake an alien invasion as an excuse to print more money and spend a lot more to take the economy out of a recession. And if an alien invasion is too far-fetched, how about we settle down to a pandemic? Anyways, Paul Krugman now says, wonking out, core inflation has gone rotten. And according to this uh, rotten article that he wrote, in a nutshell, core inflation doesn't matter anymore. Now, let's not be dismissal of this school of thought. Maybe they're right after all. But if they are right, we have to ask a few questions. If it is true that the rise in the stock market this year so far is a leading indicator of an upcoming economic recovery, and this means we will see manufacturing indicators, for example, and PMIs moving out of contraction territory back into expansion. Does it not? It also means that credit tightening by banks will be reversed and we will see a recovery in the issuance of loans. Does it not? It also means that the recent slump in real estate prices will have to be reversed and we will see real estate prices regaining value again. Does it not? If we are indeed heading into an economic recovery as the stock market predicts, then this means the recent slump in consumer spending and weakness will be reversed. Does it not? It also means that the recent wave of layoffs in the technology companies will be reversed. We will see a wave of hiring coming. Is it not? You see, we can play this game and say that the stock market is predicting an economic recovery and everything will recover. Everything will move from contraction territory back into expansion territory with exception 
of inflation. Inflation is the only one that will go down and stay down and not recover. Does it sound too good to be true for you? Because it is. When you look at the realities of this economy, we know that wage inflation continues to be hot, hot, hot. You can look at the recent examples of the labor strike that we got here in the western ports of the United States. And luckily, it appears that we have a deal and the strike is over. And here are the details. The two sides finally agreed to a 32% wage increase through 2028 and a one-time pandemic hero bonus quote-unquote of 70 million dollars the proposed pay hike consists of a four bucks point 62 cents hourly raise in the first year of the contract followed by a two bucks hourly raises each subsequent year under the expired contract union members earned an average of nearly 195 thousand dollars a year not including overtime and bonuses plus benefits worth an average of 102 thousand dollars a worker per year including health care that is fully paid by employers so again this is wage inflation and when you have wage inflation in the economy the phenomenon of inflation is not over wage inflation creates feedback and creates more inflation in the economy because now you have the purchasing power power of people increasing and now they can compete more on available goods so you look at housing for example we have a tight supply of housing if wage inflation continues to go on in the economy more and more money and higher amounts of money will compete for these supplies pushing prices higher and higher and higher and this is happening all over the place we have a strike in canada in the vancouver port right now and these workers look at what's happened here in the west coast of the united states and look at the port deal that we just got as an example of success that strikes work and they need to do a strike to secure better pay and now it's happening in ups we have a strike coming this summer union workers are now asking for better pay which again means that the company will have to pay them more at the end of the day maybe deservingly so by the way but they have to pass that extra cost all the way down to us the consumers that's inflation in the pipeline when we look at the atlanta fed wage tracker we have a little bit of a dip in wages but then if you plug in job stayers you will see that this type of inflation is actually gaining momentum and it's about to move higher again what does that say it says that employees at their current jobs they have the bargaining power now be it union or non-union employers have to pay more to retain employees that's inflationary that's more inflation coming in the pipelines because if i have to pay my employees more i have to raise prices down and then consumer otherwise my margins go down so again folks when people look at equities prices rising this year and they say that this is idiosyncratic and the reinflation of these asset prices will only happen in a good way we see everything recovering from manufacturing indicators, to service conditions, to small business conditions, to consumer purchasing power, to home prices. But somehow, inflation is not going to recover. Somehow, inflation will remain subdued. Matter of fact, inflation is over. It's done. The Fed says, mission accomplished. We're done with inflation. Don't call it a pause, though. Don't, I mean, don't call it a skip. We don't know what it is. Just don't call it a pause or a skip. Here's Pal. Sure, Pal, what's the value in, in pausing and signaling future hikes versus uh, just hiking now? I mean, not to be flippant, but I don't lose weight just by buying a gym membership. I have to actually go to the gym. 16 of your colleagues put down a higher year-end 23 rate today. A majority of you think you're going to have to go up by 50 basis points this year. So why not just uh, rip off the Band-Aid and raise rates today? So the uh, first I would say that the, the question of speed is a separate question from the question from the from from that of level. Okay, so um, and I think if you look at the SEP, that is our estimate, our individual. It's really accumulation of our individual estimates of how far to go. I, I mentioned how how we got to those numbers. In terms of speed, it's it's what I said at the beginning, which is speed was very important last year. As we get closer and closer to the destination, and according to the SEP, we're not so far away from the destination in most people's accounting. Uh, it's it's reasonable, it's common sense to go a little slower, just as it was reasonable to go from 75 basis points to 50 to 25 at every meeting. And so uh, the committee thought overall that it was appropriate to moderate the pace, if only slightly. And there are benefits to that. So that gives us more information to make decisions. We may try to make better decisions. I think it allows the economy a little more time to adapt as we as we make our decisions going forward. And we'll get to see, uh, you know, we haven't really, we don't know the full extent of, of the consequences of the banking turmoil that we've seen. We, we, it would be early to see those, but we don't know what the extent is. We'll have some more time to see that unfold. I mean, it's, a, it's just the idea that we're trying to get this right. And, uh, 
that this is, uh, if you think of the two things as separate variables, then I think, I think that the, the skip, I, I shouldn't call it a skip, the, the decision um, uh, makes sense. So he says, don't call it a skip, then he slips and says a skip, then don't call it a skip. This is a massive mistake because so far this year, everything worked out according to the book. No surprises, no uncertainty. But with this skip that the Fed has done, or shall we call it a pause, because a lot of folks say they're not going to raise again. Once they pause, they're pausing. And I remind you that they're not in the driver's seat. Inflation is. They will do whatever inflation tells them to do. And if inflation revives higher, as I will show you in this video, it will. The Fed will have no choice but to come back and raise rates again more aggressively this time around. And that will be the final nail in the coffin of this economy and market. And the catalyst for that is what central banks did this week. On one hand, you have Jerome Powell says that uh, services inflation X energy at 6.6% year on year. That's actually good. Mission accomplished. We don't need to do any more hikes. On the other hand, look at what happened in the ECB across the Atlantic. Here's Madame Lagarde. Are we done? Have we finished the journey? No. We're not at destination. Do we still have ground to cover? Yes, we have ground to cover. And I can even go further than that. I can tell you that bearing a material change to our baseline, it is very likely the case that we will continue to increase rates in July, which probably doesn't come as a big surprise to you. But that's what I'm telling you. And say what you want about Lagarde. But at least she's confident. She projects the confidence. She talks with no need for papers and handlers like Jerome Powell. And she says, we have further ground to cover. We're going to continue to raise rates. On the other hand, the Fed says, oh, we're done. It's over. Mission accomplished. What is the end result of all of that? Here it is. You see it right in front of you. So you don't say, oh, I'm just being too bearish. The evidence happened this week. The evidence is right in front of your eyes, but you're not looking at it, are you? Then you're going to come back later and say, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, that was not lying. This is a weekly chart of the euro versus the dollar. And as you can see, the euro is gaining ground over the US dollar. And the reason is the ECB is tightening. The Federal Reserve is loosening the monetary policy, meaning the value of the US dollar goes down. The value of the euro goes higher. And so far this year, the euro is up about 14 to 15 percent over the US dollar. We also heard from the RBA, the Bank of Australia. They paused, they reversed the action, and now they're hiking again. And you look at the Aussie, a weekly chart versus the dollar. It looks like the Aussie is about to gain more ground, making a higher low and about to reverse a descending negative sloping line. We look at the Canadian dollar versus the US dollar. We know that the Bank of Canada paused and now they reversed the decision and they're hiking rates once again. We see the Canadian dollar blasting higher on the expense of the US dollar. In other words, it's not just one currency. It's going to be multiple ones gaining value over the US dollar. And the reason is the Fed backed off. The Fed either says mission accomplished against inflation or we surrender. And as you can see on the weekly chart of the US dollar, now we are at a critical support, 101. If that's broken, the dollar is going to go down. And while that's going to be good for a lot of companies' margins, multinational companies, it will also be good for inflation. Inflation will also make a comeback. When the value of the US dollar goes down, we see reinflation in commodities values because most of them are priced in the US dollar. The lower the value of the US dollar, the more demand we get for these commodities. We'll talk about them one step at a time. But here's a reminder for you of the types of inflation we got this cycle so far. There is the transitory inflation. These are the shutdowns of factories and ports due to the thing. That's resolved right now. That doesn't even exist anymore. As you can see from the New York Fed, they have the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index, the GSCPI, and it is crashing, indicating there is no supply chain pressure at all. So everybody who said inflation is transitory, it's going to go away. Well, it was only one type of inflation that was transitory. It was a small part, and now it's gone. It's resolved. Yet we still have high inflation in the economy, indicating that this is, if we look at the second type of inflation that we have, monetary inflation. The Fed increases the money supply and stimulates an economy that doesn't need stimulation, and this creates inflation because there is a lot of money that floats in the system. Usually this money floats at the top. The investment firms, corporations, hedge funds. And what they do is they use all of this money, all of this cheap money, and they buy assets, be it real estate, be it commodities, be it equities. And we see all of these markets inflating significantly higher. This is the most challenging part of inflation because 
it doesn't go down until the cycle is broken. And usually, the only way we know how is to create a recession in the economy by crushing the aggregate demand. And the only way we know how to do that is by raising the unemployment rate higher. And then, of course, you have the third type of inflation. I'm calling it price gouging here for simplicity reasons, but it's actually called reactionary inflation, which is in reaction to monetary inflation. This includes wages. This includes the rise in input costs. And the reaction of that is price gouging. Corporations raise prices to stay ahead of inflation. And this could be the weakest type of inflation right now. And the reason is the pricing power for a lot of companies is actually deteriorating. They can no longer pass the extra cost all the way down to the end consumer because the consumer has gotten a lot weaker after about two years of aggressive inflation. Their savings are down, their credit cards are maxed. But the strongest type of inflation and the most sticky type of inflation is the monetary inflation. And if the Fed relaxes, declares mission accomplished, and as they did before the job is done. And on top of that, you have other central banks raising rates. The drop in the dollar will revive monetary inflation, which means a lot of this money that is still floating in the system right now, evident by the stock market, will now flow into commodities as the dollar goes down, and it will flow into the kind of stocks that benefit when the dollar goes down, which will create more inflation, and the Fed will have to come back and be more aggressive. I'm not just predicting that, folks. Of course, we can have a systemic risk event, and all of this is cut short, and we crash just like we did back in 08. But assuming the systemic risk is not here right now, and the Fed has not done enough, then we should see reinflation in the economy. And this reinflation will be led by commodities reinflation. I'm not just predicting that. It's already happening this week so far. The moment the Fed said, we're done, it's over, and then the ECB said, uh, it's not over for us. And the dollar went down. Look at the weekly gains in these commodities. Natural gas, up over 16% for the week. Oats, up 13% for the week. Soybean oil, up 9% for the week. So is wheat. Palladium, up 8%. Heating oil, up 8%. Canola, corn, up almost 6% for the week. All beating the NASDAQ, by the way. Here, you're seeing reinflation in commodities happening right before your eyes. We know that the fundamentals for commodities are actually really, really strong. They just need the spark. And the spark is for the Fed to back off and to allow reinflation in commodities. Well, it's happening now, so let's examine the fundamentals of each of these commodities. We know that Goldman Sachs in the beginning of the year said that they're bullish commodities because they see a sharp destocking. Of course, commodities did not move so far this year, at least until now. So Goldman flip-flopped and said, okay, we're wrong about our view, but we're going to stick with it. And I say, what? This is like the Fed skipping and the saying, oh, we're going to raise rates later on. Why would you say you're wrong? But stick to the view. You're right. You got the right call. Stick with it. Don't say you're wrong because you're not wrong. We look at oil, for example. Here's a monthly chart for Brent oil. And as you can see in the latest episode, 2007 all the way to 09, we have seen a massive surge in oil prices. And then came the systemic crash. Bear Stearns crashed, Lehman Brothers crashed, the economy crashed, and with it, oil prices went down, only to reinflate later on. In this episode that we got right now, we know that oil prices are off the peak. But if the Fed is relaxing and we see the value of the dollar goes down, while the global economy, the demand in the global economy as the bulls in the stock market predict that we're going to have a soft landing, then the demand for oil should recover. And with it, prices. And we will see reinflation in oil prices. You look at the gasoline RBOB. This is a weekly chart. This is what you paid the pump. Are we looking at a reverse head and shoulder formation? Or we're about to see reinflation in the gasoline RBOB futures? which means you're going to pay more at the pump. Again, if the Fed relaxes and the ECB continues to raise rates higher, the value of the dollar will go down and you will see a recovery here. And it could get out of hand, by the way. And the reason is we have a significant net shorting positioning in oil. We haven't seen this since the lows of 2020 when oil prices went down to negative. In other words, a lot of oil shorts entered the year with the assumption that we have a recession coming. Of course, the recession will happen and it could have happened this year had the Fed done the job. But the Fed relaxed and allowed reinflation in the economy, starting by equities prices, starting by home prices. And now little by little, we're going to see manufacturing prices recovering. We're going to see services prices recovering and inflation recovering. 
And if that is the case, if it goes this way, then these shorts will be caught with their pants down and they will have to short cover aggressively. Since October, the so-called October bottom, they've been shorting, 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 shorting aggressively, which means we could see an epic short squeeze in energy. But this requires a trigger. We know that we have the supply side and the demand side. Oil shorts been shorting because of the demand side, not the supply side. Oil shorts see a demand destruction story in oil. That's their thesis. So when you have a top producer like Saudi Arabia and the energy minister coming out pretty much every meeting and saying, hey, watch out shorts, watch out. I'm going to reduce the supply and force you to get squeezed. The shorts would say, yeah, we don't care. The problem is not the supply. The problem is the demand. This is why we're shorting. And every time we see a recovery in oil futures, we're going to short even more. And of course, the Saudis will up the ante even more in their threats to reduce supplies. I don't know if you read this story in the Washington Post. It's about the Discord leaks. And in these documents, Allegedly, the Saudi crown prince did threaten to sever ties with the United States if the price of oil keeps being pushed down. In other words, Saudi Arabia is really serious about keeping oil prices higher. And the sweet spot they're looking at is 80 bucks a barrel or above. And now we see another weird story with the tankers of oil, Saudi tankers, giant ones, clustering in the Red Sea. And the question becomes, are the Saudis going with plan B? Since plan A did not work out, announcing supply cuts did not work out, are they actually going to move to action now? Hey, oil shorts, we told you we're going to cut supplies. You did not believe us. Now watch this. We're going to keep these tankers at sea and nobody's getting these supplies. What are you going to do now? That could be plan B. But again, folks, the reason why shorts been shorting oil, it's not due to an oversupply problem. It is due to demand destruction. What did we get this week when it comes to the demand? We got news that the Joey B administration is now planning to refill the SPR. They're going to buy about 12 million barrels. So that's demand recovering. Yet the big kahuna when it comes to oil markets is China. And this week we got news that China is issuing more stimulus to stimulate demand in their economy. So now, all of a sudden, we have a better outlook for oil. On the supply side, we have the Saudis being really aggressive. On the demand side, we have the dollar going down, increasing demand for oil. We have China issuing stimulus. And we also have the Joy B administration refilling the SPR. You sprinkle on top of that a potential of a massive short squeeze, and we could see severe reinflation in oil prices. What will Jerome Powell do then? And it's not just oil. Let's look at natural gas, the top performing commodity this week so far. Now, if you've been following me, you know that I'm bullish natural gas. I believe price has already bottomed. Natural gas stocks been the top performers last year. They're holding pretty good right now. And the answer is, are we about to see reinflation in nat gas prices? The answer is probably. And the retracement could take us all the way back to 3.8, 3.9, if not 4 bucks per mm BTU. Now, I've made a video a few weeks ago. We talked about the fundamentals in natural gas and how the suppliers of natural gas just declared war on the shorts by crushing the rig counts. In that video, we talked about the fundamentals of natural gas in details. We compared Kotera versus EQT in details. And here's the update for you. The rig counts continue to go down, meaning that oil producers are reducing supplies. But again, as in oil, the thesis is for shorts it's not really the supplies it's the demand and now perhaps we're going to get better dynamics when it comes to demand because we have a heat wave coming in this country it's already happening in certain parts and we have the dollar going down which means we will have more demand for night gas you look at european demand for example it doubled European gas prices doubled in 10 days, and then they added 30% on top of that. And the reason is we have a top supplier in the Netherlands closing permanently due to earthquakes or whatever, which means more demand will be routed to where? The Henry Hub, the natural gas commodity in the United States, which means higher prices to come. Of course, the volatility is insane in natural gas. Anybody who trades natural gas knows that. So on Friday, European natural gas prices went down big. But this is the beginning of this volatility. The summer season will bring better demand. The supply is getting tightened. And on top of that, the dollar is getting crushed because the Fed declared victory against inflation prematurely. Will it be surprising to see reinflation in natural gas prices? The answer is absolutely not. Let's talk about another one. How about lumber? Here's the chart for lumber, a weekly chart. And as you can see recently, we have seen a recovery. Perhaps lumber put in a bottom, forming a bull flag right now. And it is moving its way higher. 
The dollar goes down, more demand for lumber. The Fed declares victory. The Fed says we're done, it's over. This will mean higher prices for lumber. And the recent Canadian wildfires, of course, will reduce supply even more. While the demand is about to heat up because the dollar is down, the Fed declares mission accomplished. We're going to see a revival of demand in housing. So now we have a better supply versus demand dynamic when it comes to lumber. Not for the consumer side, of course, but from the investor side. Will it be surprising to see lumber prices moving higher? Absolutely not. What about another soft commodity? Sugar. Sugar futures been on a tear since 2020. Up almost 200%. Now, we talked in a previous video about sugar prices and the leading indicators and the reasons, the fundamental reasons why we see sugar prices moving higher. The answer comes from the supply. We have a supply problem, but also elevated demand. And therefore, we're going to see higher prices for sugar. Anything that has sugar in it, sweet foods, drinks, will cost you more. The supplies are down, be it from Brazil, China, EU, India, Thailand. They're not covering what's lost. And the demand continues to go higher and higher and higher. Now, as the Fed backs off and the value of the dollar goes down, we will see more demand for sugar. And where is the supply? It's not here. The end result is, look at this. When we look at European sugar, the prices are pretty much at all time highs. You look at the inflation rate for all of these food commodities in the European Union, and you can see that sugar is at number one. 55% increase year on year. 55%. And the reason is European production is down. The supply is down. And we have a major supplier, Ukraine. That's in a war right now, so the supplies are going down even further. And it's not surprising that the operating profit for sugar producers in the European Union is doubling this year. Now, you look at sugar mills in India, those are doing pretty good too. We don't have a lot of exposure here in the United States in sugar production. We don't produce a lot of sugar. But you look at international markets and sugar mill stocks are on fire. So we already have an insane inflation in sugar right now. While the Fed pauses prematurely and we see other central banks raising rates, the end result is the destruction of the value of the US dollar, which means sugar prices will continue to go higher. That's a revival of inflation. It's already here and it's about to get worse. And of course, we can't talk about the inflation in sugar prices without talking about the inflation in cocoa prices. Your favorite. Oh, you're going to pay more for cocoa. Chocolate is set to get more expensive as cocoa prices soar to seven-year high. Look at this chart. Since September of last year, up about 50%. I was just warming up here. The Fed is dropping the value of the U.S. dollar. Look at the correlation. The U.S. dollar topped last year, and it has been trending down since then. Hand in hand, we see reinflation in cocoa prices. Now the Federal Reserve and the ECB, one pausing rates, the other increasing rates, and the end result of that is the US dollar will continue to go down, which means cocoa prices will continue to go higher. On top of that, we have other fundamental reasons. As we talk with every other commodity, the supplies are going down. We have climate change, we have environmental reasons, climate reasons such as El Nino, reducing supplies of cocoa, coffee beans, orange juice, and now the Fed just added more fuel to this fire. Since we talked about OJ, here it is. One of the top performing commodities so far since 2020. The prices of OJ went higher by over 200%, tripling in price, to the point where an American classic staple for breakfast, OJ, is now becoming a luxury. You have to pay an arm and a leg to buy OJ. Of course, the Fed crushing the dollar by announcing that inflation is over prematurely, mission accomplished, this will increase the price of the commodity on its own. Now you plug in the fundamentals, such as the problems in Brazil, one of the top producers of OJ, or the fact that Florida is now having the smallest citrus crop in a century. Is it really surprising that we see OJ prices climbing higher? The answer is absolutely not. Will it be surprising to see them even higher? The answer is Absolutely not. When we look at meat prices, look at cattle prices right here, reaching highs, making higher highs, massive gain. And it's not stopping anytime soon. And the Fed reducing the value of the US dollar will increase the demand on cattle. We have a limited supply of cattle, which means prices will continue to move higher and higher and higher. You're going to pay more and more and more at the grocery store when it comes to beef, even chicken. You look at this chart. I mean, steaks are out of control right now, but steaks always been a luxury. Yet we're talking about chicken. Even chicken is becoming more expensive than ever now. You see the reinflation in chicken breast moving higher again. You got pork chops moving down. That's a relief, but prices are still elevated, historically speaking. You look at these charts and the Fed is declaring mission accomplished right now. Isn't this insanity, folks? The answer is absolutely yes. How about we look at oats futures? Here's a weekly chart for oat. Big recovery this week. 
massive pop. Oh, we're just warming up here. You could see these prices recovering to the 500, 600 levels easily. Now that the dollar is about to go down because the Fed announced that mission accomplished, it's over. The fundamentals for oats are supplies going down, demand skyrocketing. Matter of fact, oat crops are down to record lows since 1866, the lowest crop since 1866. Meanwhile, demand for oat milk is surging higher. If the Fed relaxes, what do you think will happen? to oats prices. I think the answer is clear. Let's look at soy. Here's the performance of soybeans futures. Look at this big pop in the last few weeks. Massive pop as the dollar continues to go down. You look at soybean oil futures. Look at this weekly chart breaking out big gains for this commodity. And the Fed now will add more fuel to the fire by devaluing the US dollar. We will look at where soy is produced in this country. Great Plains, Midwest, sure. What do we have right now? Severe drought in top producing states such as Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota. So the fundamentals for higher soy prices are here. You add the Chinese recovery on top of that. Sure, higher we go. If we have more stimulus in China, if it is successful to begin with, but most importantly, the demand will rise higher by the Fed devaluing the dollar and declaring mission accomplished against inflation prematurely. When we look at wheat, here's the chart of wheat futures. Look at this beautiful recovery this week. One of the top gaining commodities. We zoom out to a weekly chart. There's plenty of room here. If this one wants to recover, it can go higher and higher and higher. Now that the dollar is down and the Fed says it's over, why not buy some wheat? and stick it to the Fed. Stick those bushels right in the Fed's ass. You say inflation is over, right? Now watch this. We know that we have a war in Ukraine and the supplies are all over the place. Ukraine, it depends on the war. It depends on what Russia wants to do. Russian supplies are okay. European supplies are down. US supplies are down. Australian and Canadian supplies are okay. But perhaps the outlook for US supplies is much worse than expectations. Look at this. The headline from the Wall Street Journal says, Severe drought stuns Great Plains wheat crops. What are they talking about? Here it is. We have a story about a farmer, last name Miller Shasky, 59 years old. He's abandoning 90% of the 4,000 acres in the southwest Kansas that he seeded with his two adult sons. This is going to be my worst wheat harvest ever ever, he said. Other plain states like Oklahoma, Texas are expected to abandon wheat at even higher rates than Kansas. Kansas is the top winter wheat producer state in the country. The U.S. is among the top five global producers of wheat. What do we have in Kansas? Here it is. Record drought all over the place. So the supply of wheat is severely damaged. On top of that, we know what's going on in Ukraine. We talked about the collapse of the dam, flooding all of these zones, all of these fields in Ukraine. We look at the top producing regions in Ukraine. They all happen to be in the south. No wonder why the Russians are taking those, by the way. Are you surprised? Wheat is one of the most important commodities on the planet. But you look at where the dam is, now it's flooding all of these wheat fields. And oh, by the way, now the Russians say, the Kremlin says no positive prospects for Black Sea grain deal renewal. Not gonna happen. And now we have a confirmation. The Russians say the deal cannot be extended. And it's not just wheat, by the way. You look at the stockpiles of rice, for example, they've already peaked and now they're going down. So we have a massive supply problem in these grain commodities. And the Fed is now pouring more fuel in this fire by stimulating demand all of a sudden. By saying mission accomplished, inflation is over, we're pausing, we're devaluing the dollar. As the ECB and other central banks raise rates, we could see part two of commodities reinflation. And here's the risk, folks. So far, for everybody who says, oh, inflation is gone, we have a soft landing in the economy. Understand that inflation is sticky. Inflation is way too high. Inflation is far from over. Go to the grocery store and ask the consumers, not the Wall Streeters on TV. Ask the consumer, is inflation over or not? You will not get an answer that it is over. The majority of consumers, according to poll after poll after poll, say that the inflation problem is still too much for the U.S. economy. And the only reason we're seeing CPI headline readings going down, number one, energy inflation is down year on year. That doesn't mean that energy prices are down. And oh, by the way, energy prices are about to recover based on the recent action by the Fed and the ECB. Number two, we have the base effect. And we have that effect all the way till June. But after June's CPI, the base impacts will go away. If we indeed see commodities reinflation between now until the July CPI comes out in August, what do you think will happen? 
we will see CPI above 5.5% again, if not above 6% again, year on year. That's the headline reading. On the other hand, the core CPI will actually firm up higher again after consolidating and moving down by a bit. Then what do you think the Fed will do? They're going to have to come back and raise rates more aggressively this time around. Forget about 25 basis points. It's going to be 50. And here we go again. Jackson Hole summer of 2022 all over again. Now we have to look at the positive side. If we do indeed have reinflation in commodities prices, how can you play that? You can buy individual futures if you'd like. You have uh, commodities indices such as the Bloomberg Commodities Index. Look at this monthly chart. Big rebound today or this week, I should say. Some would argue, I mean, the month is still young, but if we close like this, some would argue that this is a reversal candle. We will see commodities reinflating. This is one index that you can buy and have exposure to commodities. If you believe that the rise in equities prices is not idiosyncratic, it is a result of a Fed not doing its job. And we will see a revival of inflation along with other prices, not just equities. If you do, then commodities is a good bet. Of course, that also supports the rotation in equities to commodities-related stocks, such as energy and metals. But I'm going to talk about that in tomorrow's video. Right now, in this video, I'm presenting the case for commodities reinflation. Another way you can play it is, if you're not sure, if you say, mm, maybe we're going to head into a recession maverick, I don't want to take a lot of risk here betting on reinflation. In the meantime, as the dollar goes down and we see these prospects of reinflation going on, you can buy certain call options in these commodities indices. A few days ago, I presented this trade for the channel, the ticker WEAT Wheat, which tracks wheat commodities, but also a lot of uh, oats and sugar and other food commodities. And the trade was buying the seven bucks calls with the expiration date of July 21st. That would have cost you about 15 cents a piece. Now the value of this contract is 30 cents a piece. So it doubled in value in a short amount of time. You can book the profits. You can, if you believe in commodities reinflation and higher prices for wheat to come, you can convert this into shares and hold the ticker. But for now, I'm being cautious. So I'm buying these commodities using calls. And the reason is, the risk for an accident is still too high. And we have seen this back in 07, 08. The argument back then was that inflation is too stubborn and the Fed will have to raise rates further. But we started to see banks and real estate lenders blowing up one by one. And the threat of a systemic accident took care of inflation. Now, we have other cases in the past, most famously in the 1970s and 1980s, when we saw a second wave of inflation. And that usually happened after the Fed backed off prematurely and declared victory against inflation prematurely. Then we saw the second wave of inflation. Because historically speaking, we know that to defeat inflation, you have to end the cycle. You end the cycle by destroying the aggregate demand in the economy. The only way we know how is to increase the employment rate higher. And the only way we know how to increase the unemployment rate higher is by jacking up the federal funds rate higher and higher and higher until something breaks. Well, the Fed is not doing that. The Fed says, let's pause, let's skip and see what happens. Well, maybe what's going to happen is reinflation in commodities prices as we discussed in this video. And with that, folks, we have reached the conclusion of this segment. Hopefully you found it informative. And if you did, please return the favor by subscribing, pressing the like button, and leave a comment telling us what you think about all of this. Until then, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Stay tuned. All right. God save the queen, man.